time on companies uh, which had their offices in the trade towers. And there is no company, to the best of our knowledge, which has been more profoundly affected than a company called Cantor Fitzgerald. Which is some on Wall Street, Cantor Fitzgerald sort of symbolizes the devastation of the terrorist attack when American Airlines flight number 11 uh, crashed into the North Tower. It cut off any hope of escape for almost all of the Cantor employees. The global leader in real In the high-flying world of high finance, Beyond the company of Cantor Fitzgerald occupies an elite position. Last year, the firm handled $50 trillion of business as an exchange market for banks and companies doing trades in the global bond market. And for its headquarters, Cantor chose an elite location, proudly showcased in its corporate video, the North Tower of the World Trade Center. About 1,000 of Cantor's employees worked on the 101st, 103rd, 104th, and 105th floors of the tower. Doug Gardner was the chief financial officer of Cantor, his wife, really Jennifer. Doug is everyone's shoulders. If you, if you need support, his shoulders. If you need money or, or a helping hand, there was his hands. If you needed legs for a basketball game, he was there. He just was everybody's rock, everybody's center. The warmest, kindest, biggest smile, big blue eyes. The most delicious man you ever met.
As CFO, Gardner had a window office on the executive wing of the 105th floor. Gardner liked to get in early. He was at his desk at 8.48 a.m. on Tuesday. Jennifer Gardner didn't find out right away that a plane had crashed into the North Tower, hitting between floors 96 and 103. She was with her children, Michael and Julia. Did your husband talk to anyone that morning when the plane hit? Yes. Doug's father, Joe Gardner, called Doug at 10 of 9 when we heard, he heard on the news that there was an explosion. And Doug answered the phone and said, we're evacuating. We have to get out of here. And Doug's father just said, go, go. So, you know, I heard someone called me and told me that someone talked to Doug. And I was like, fine. So I went home kind of casually to watch what happened. And then I saw the building collapse. And I felt his presence just leave me. Cantor Fitzgerald has set up a corporate center at the Pierre Hotel, providing up-to-date information and grief counseling. Two employees who were on the concourse level survived, badly burned in critical condition. None of the hundreds of employees on the upper floors is believed to have made it out. Have you told your children? Julia doesn't really understand anything. She feels the intense emotion around her, but she's still too much of a baby. Michael is five. He knows. We told him that um, there was a big accident at Daddy's building, and we can't find him. And then the next day, he woke up and he said, I think Daddy died. I want them to know that Daddy did not leave because he wanted to, but that he was taken. And then it wasn't his fault, and it wasn't their fault, and that Daddy loved them. Howard Lutnick, the CEO of Cantor Fitzgerald, was best friends with Doug Gardner. Lutnick had been on top of the world, celebrating his 40th birthday this past July in Europe with Doug and Jennifer Gardner and other friends in the company. Last Tuesday, his world and his company crumbled around him. Of the 1,000 Cantor employees at the uh, Trade Center, only 300 are accounted for at this time, and none was at the building at that time. This immense human loss has truly devastated the chairman and CEO, Howard Lutnick, whose own brother is missing and presumed dead. You have suffered such great professional and personal loss. Do you, what is the fate of your brother? Well, my brother, my brother was on the 103rd floor. He worked, he worked for me, and um, he worked at Cantor. And uh, he, he called my sister uh, just after the, just after the plane hit, and he told her that um, he said that the smoke was pouring in. He was, he was stuck in a corner office. There was no way out, and the smoke was coming in. And he's, he's not good, and and things are not good, and he's not going to make it. And he just wanted to say that he loved her. When he wanted to say goodbye and uh, tell everyone that that he loved them, and then the phone went the phone went dead. So, so while I'm the head of the company, I'm trying to help my 700 employees who are missing their their loved ones. I'm just just another one of them. Just another one of them. Normally, you would have been in your office uh, on which floor? 105th floor. On the 105th floor. And yet you didn't go in early that morning because of a critical decision you made. <laughs> my, uh, my little boy, I have a five-year-old, and it was his first day of kindergarten at, uh, at Horace Mann. So I took him for his first day of big boy school. And uh, because of that, I was late getting down to the office. And uh, therefore, I, I wasn't in the building. I was on my way to the building. And Good morning, Laurie. Good morning. My name is Laurie Van Auken. I am speaking today on behalf of 9-11 widows Monica Gabriel and Mindy Kleinberg, who are here with me today. On the morning of September 11th, my husband Kenneth was killed while at his office on the 105th floor of the North Tower at the World Trade Center. We extend our sincere thanks to you, Representative McKinney, as well as to all of those who are responsible for setting up this hearing and giving us this opportunity today. On the morning of September 11th, I received the following message from my husband, Kenneth. Oh, messages. I love you. I 
job in the World Trade Center. The building was hit by something. I, I don't know if I'm going to get out, but I love you very much. Uh, I, I hope I'll see you later. Bye. End of messages. From his words, I knew that Ken survived the impact of the plane. So I tried to call him back, but there was no answer. I fell to my knees in a panic, still clutching the telephone. A moment later, when the phone rang, it startled me completely. I prayed that it was Ken. But it was my mother. She told me to turn the television on. I told her about Ken's message. I told her that I couldn't reach him. I told her that I was very scared. I watched the TV in utter horror as black smoke billowed out from the building through a gaping hole the size of an airplane. I knew that Kenny was in that building. I watched as the people ran from the World Trade Center, hoping for a glimpse of my husband. Then the second tower was hit. As I continued to watch the breaking news, they showed the president sitting in an elementary school classroom, juxtaposed with the footage of the black smoke coming from the World Trade Center along with people jumping to their deaths from the burning buildings. I screamed at the television, get up, President Bush, get up and do something. But he remained seated in a classroom of small children. I watched as Andrew Card whispered something to the president, and yet still my president remained seated in a classroom of small children when our country was so obviously under a terrorist attack. In between panic and hysteria, in between hoping that my husband would get out of the World Trade Center alive and wondering how I would ever break this news to my children, I also wondered why the Secret Service was letting the President stay in the classroom full of children. Why didn't they whisk him away? It seemed as if every target in America was being attacked. So wasn't the President, the leader of the free world, in danger of being fatally attacked as well? Weren't the children who were in the classroom with the President in danger too? After two days and hundreds of phone calls to New York City hospitals and to the Red Cross receiving no guidance and absolutely no answers, my husband's employer, Howard Lutnick, the CEO of Cantor Fitzgerald, recounted on a news program that no one who was in the offices of Cantor Fitzgerald at the time of the attacks had survived. That meant that Ken was gone. My looming and painful question as to whether or not my husband had survived was now answered. We now knew that the time for hoping was over. Our lives were forever changed. My children would never again see their father, and I was now a widow. The grieving was just beginning. With what felt like a gaping hole in my heart, with two traumatized teens to now raise alone, I wondered if I would ever feel like eating or breathing again. For me, one horribly sad question had been answered, but many more questions would soon follow. The questions began to gnaw at me slowly at first. I wondered how on earth almost two hours could have passed with four domestic commercial airplanes flying around the skies of America without a response from our military. I began to Google search and read whatever articles and timelines I could get my hands on. Once I began my research into 9-11, I found it hard to leave the computer. Because I was unable to sleep and because I needed desperately to reconstruct and understand the events of 9-11, it began to appear to those close to me that I was shackled to the computer, and I have to admit, in a manner of speaking, I was. Having connected with a few other widows, it was not long before we were all researching the events, while we waited for an official inquiry into the attacks to be initiated. Then the news came. Only intelligence agency failures would be examined. How could that be? Our husbands were killed at their desks when commercial airplane, airplanes flew into their office buildings. They had no means of escaping and had practically no chance of evacuating on 9-11. The buildings that were supposedly so magnificently designed had collapsed in minutes. Why would the investigation of our loved ones' murders be limited to only intelligence agencies? What about airline security, high-rise building security, and border security? What about the FAA, the Port Authority, the Secret Service, and NORAD, all of whom were partly to blame for the failures that allowed the 9-11 attacks to occur? Didn't those areas and entities need to be investigated too? Incredulous but undeterred, we realized that it was necessary to take a thorough, an independent look at what had gone wrong on 9-11. Our children were going to have to grow up in this changed world, and we needed to make sure that this could never happen again. We knew that with the 3,000 deaths on 9-11, there remained thousands of questions that needed to be answered. So 
We fought for the creation of the 9-11 Commission, and with all of America by our side, we finally won that battle. The Commission was passed into law in the autumn of 2002, and by January 2003, the Commission finally sat down to commence its very important work. The 9-11 Commission's report is one year old today. This report was supposed to provide the definitive account of what had transpired on September 11, 2001. We hoped that our thousands of unanswered questions would be addressed and answered. Yet incredibly, we have found that the Commission's definitive final report has actually yielded more questions than answers. Moreover, there are still so many areas that remain unexplained or only vaguely touched upon by the 9-11 Commission, so much so that it was quite difficult for me to decide where I should start my testimony to you today. One, the timeline of 9-11, the story of seismic information. I will begin with what I had first hoped for from the Commission. I believe that we needed the official timeline, the official and definitive timeline for 9-11. One of my questions had to do with the time that Flight 93 officially crashed. The Commission report says United 93 crashed in Pennsylvania at 10.03.11 a.m. and adds that the precise crash time has been the subject of dispute. In footnote 168 of chapter 1 it says, Quote, we also reviewed a report regarding, se regarding seismic observations on September 11, 2001, whose authors concluded that the impact time of United 93 was 10.06.05. Seismic data reflects the time that the Earth shook in response to the crash. Atomic clocks are used to record this data. I personally spoke with the men whose names appear on the seismic data report from 9-11. They received calls from the 9-11 Commission, too. I asked the seismologists, unless data existed that showed that the Earth also shook at 10.03 a.m., how could the Commission affix the time of Flight 93's crash to 10.03? They couldn't give me an answer, nor apparently could the Commissioners in their final report. The crash of Flight 93 is one of the major events of 9-11. If we couldn't figure out what time that crash occurred, how could we ever understand the real complexities of the day? Perhaps most alarmingly, what does this say about the quality of the rest of the work product in the final report if the Commission could not accurately isolate this easily defined piece of information? Two, warnings, the story of ignored warnings by individuals. At 1.47 p.m. on September 11, 2001, while aboard Air Force One, Ari Fleischer was asked the following question by press briefing pool. Quote, had there been any warnings that the President knew of? Close quote. Mr. Fleischer answered simply, quote, no warnings. No warnings. From my simple research using Google on my home computer, I learned that there were plenty of warnings. For example, newspapers in England, France, Germany, and Russia reported that there were indeed many warnings delivered to the Bush administration throughout the spring and summer of 2001. German intelligence warned both American and Israeli agencies that terrorists might be planning to hijack commercial aircraft to use them as weapons and to attack important American targets. During the G8 summit in Genoa, Italy, during the month of July 2001, Egypt warned of a plot to use airplanes to attack President Bush while he was there for the summit. As an aside, this warning was taken so seriously that anti-aircraft missiles were deployed near the Columbus Airport in Italy. Even ABC News reported Bush administration officials acknowledged that U.S. intelligence officials informed President Bush weeks before the September 11th attacks that bin Laden's terrorist network might try to hijack American planes. Likewise, Newsweek reported that as many as 10 to 12 warnings were issued and more than two of the warnings specifically mentioned the possibilities of hijackings. Similarly, George Tenet was issuing many warnings that bin Laden was the most immediate threat to Americans. Indeed, the al-Qaeda warnings were dire enough in May of 2001 to motivate President Bush to appoint, appoint Vice President Cheney to head a task force to combat terrorist attacks on the United States. As reported by the Washington Post, President Bush said that Vice President Cheney would direct a government-wide review on managing the consequences of a domestic terrorist attack. And Vice President Cheney was quoted as saying, I will periodically chair a meeting of the National Security Council to review these efforts. But according to the Washington Post, neither Cheney's review nor Bush's took place. The 9-11 report chose not to address any of the aforementioned warnings, and thus, in my opinion, did not answer the most important question, which was, with all of these warnings, why were we still so ill-prepared? Three, 
that's not connected, the story of David Frasca. It would seem that the radical fundamentalist unit, the RFU, at FBI headquarters was in receipt of various pieces of information that, if put together, should have allowed them to see that a threatening pattern involving persons of interest was emerging during the summer of 2001. For example, the RFU was in receipt of both the Phoenix memo, the FBI memo that suggested there was a pattern of suspicious activity involving large numbers of Arab men taking flying lessons in American flight schools, and the FBI's file on Zacharias Musawi, an Arab man who was enrolled in an American flight school and fit the profile of a terrorist. While the 9-11 Commission goes into much detail about the facts surrounding the Phoenix memo and the case of Zacharias Musawi, they do not mention perhaps the most damning of all facts involving both issues, namely that it was only two individuals at the RFU who received the Phoenix memo and the Musawi information within weeks of each other. They subsequently and detrimentally blocked not only the dissemination of this information within the community, but also stymied further requested avenues of investigation within the community of such pieces of vital information. The 9-11 Commission summarily blames the failure to connect the two dots of the Phoenix memo and Zacharias Musawi's file on the FBI's mis in the FBI's institutional misunderstanding of the Reno Wall and the agency's inherent inability to share information across and throughout its ranks. What is missing from this analysis and rather facile conclusion is that it was two individuals who worked together and not a misunderstanding of the Reno Wall that is to blame for the failure of the FBI to receive a FISA warrant in the case of Zacharias Musawi. It is likewise those same individuals who are responsible for the Phoenix memo being downplayed and all but ignored. FBI Supervisor David Frasca and his underling Michael Maltby not only failed to permit FBI agents to request a FISA warrant for Musawi, but also altered the agent's initial request for it. Specifically, on August 28, 2001, Maltby edited the, Minnesota's FBI, the Minnesota FBI's request for a FISA warrant to search Zacharias Musawi's possessions. The Minnesota FBI field office wanted to prove that Musawi was connected to al-Qaeda through a rebel group in Chechnya, but the RFU agent Maltby removed the information <clears throat> connecting the Chechnyan rebels to al-Qaeda. Subsequently, the FBI deputy general counsel who received the edited request, scrubbed clean of any international terrorist ties, decided that there wasn't enough of a connection between Musawi and al-Qaeda to allow an application for a search warrant through FISA. Thus, a FISA warrant was never even applied for. Later, in a report released on June 9, 2005, the FBI's Inspector General's office, far from downplaying this exchange, cited a top FBI lawyer's statement that, quote, he had never seen a supervisory special agent in headquarters so adamant that a FISA warrant could not be obtained and at the same time a field office so adamant that it could. Close quote. The report also noted that the Minneapolis field office sought an expedited FISA, which it explained normally involved reports of suspected imminent attack or other imminent danger. To reiterate, the first memo the supervisor of the radical fundamentalist unit, David Frasca, received warned that Osama bin Laden was probably coordinating efforts to send men for flight training, the Phoenix memo, and only a few weeks later, Frasca received a file on a suspicious individual, Musawi, actually training at a flight school. In essence, the Musawi case was actual confirmation of the Phoenix Memo's prediction. And it was these same men, Frasca and Maltby, who not only thwarted the efforts, efforts of FBI agents to get a FISA warrant to search Musawi's belongings, including his laptop that had information leading to other 9-11 hijackers, but it was also Frasca and Maltby who tampered with the papers requesting a FISA warrant. Musawi's laptop was finally searched after the 9-11 attacks. German telephone numbers were found, as was the name Ahad Sabet. The numbers led the FBI to determine that the name Ahad Sabet was an alias for Ramzi bin al-Sheib, former roommate of Mohammed Atta, the pilot of American Airlines Flight 11, which crashed into Tower One, my husband's building, on 9-11. Agents also discovered that Ramzi bin al-Sheib had wired money to Musawi in the summer of 2001. In addition, they found a document connecting Musawi with the Malaysian Yazid Sufat, a connection that could have led them to 9-11 hijackers Khalid al-Madar and Nawaf al-Hazmi. 
<clears throat> Those were two of the hijackers said to have crashed Flight 77 into the Pentagon. Both Almodar and Al-Hazmi lived in San Diego, California, had their names blatantly published in the San Diego phone book, and had contacts with individuals under FBI investigation. At the time of Musawi's arrest, one FBI agent commented in his case notes quite prophetically that Musawi seemed like a man who was capable of flying airplanes into the World Trade Center. Sadly, the FBI agents were trying their best to follow these leads, but for some unknown reason, FBI headquarters thwarted their own agents instead of thwarting the terrorists. While several entities refer, I'm sorry, while several entries refer to Musawi in the Commission's final report, the Commission fails to discuss the Musawi case in a comprehensive manner. For example, how could the Commission fail to mention that it was these two men, David Frasca and Michael Maltby at the FBI's Radical Fundamentalist Unit, who received the Phoenix memo and then thwarted attempts to acquire a FISA warrant for Musawi's computer? How could the Commission remain silent on this matter when these men, Frasca and Maltby, have since been promoted within the FBI? Why didn't the Commission apply the axiom that an agency is only as good as the people who work for it? To quote Senator Shelby, they continue to reward bad behavior, and the results speak for themselves. By leaving this highly relevant fact unaddressed, the Commission lays bare that its conclusion about the need for intelligence community reforms is half-baked at best and hollow at worst. Four, the Hamburg cell, the story of Marwin and a phone number. <clears throat> Had David Frasca and Michael Maltby not altered the FISA application, it is likely that the FBI would have discovered that the members of the notorious would have discovered the members of the notorious Hamburg cell. The Hamburg cell, the Hamburg Al Qaeda cell, was central to the 9/11 plot. Members of this cell included lead hijacker Mohammed Atta, who is said to have piloted Flight 11, 9/11 hijacker Zia Jara. 9-11 hijacker Marwan al-Shehi, who was said to have piloted Flight 175, and Ramzi bin al-Sheib, who wired money to the hijackers. Further proof of the significance of the Hamburg cell can be found in the fact that in, Mar in March 1999, Marwan al-Shehi had already caught the attention of German intelligence officials who were monitoring the telephone of Mohammed Haidar Zamar, an Islamic extremist in Hamburg, who was closely linked to important al-Qaeda plotters who ultimately masterminded the 9-11 attacks. The German intelligence officials gave the central intelligence agencies the first name of Marwin and his telephone number in the United Arab Emirates and asked CIA to track him. Nevertheless, according to the official record, CIA did nothing with this information. Close surveillance of Marwan al-Shehi in 1999 would have revealed his early connections to Flight 11 hijacker Mohammed Atta, who was Mr. Al-Shehi's room, al roommate at the time. Both men had also attended the wedding of a fellow Muslim at, at a radical mosque in Hamburg of October 1999, an event considered to be significant for the September 11th hijacking teams because it occurred at a time when the 9-11 plot was taking shape. Yet the requested surveillance on Marwan never happened. It would seem that the director of the CIA at the time, George Tenet, did not feel that they had enough information to be able to track down this terrorist. He has stated, quote, the Germans gave us a name, Marwin, that's it, and a phone number. The director of Central Intelligence replied, adding, they didn't give us a first and last name until after 9-11. It seems unbelievable that with a first name and a phone number, the CIA would not have even attempted to follow up on this lead. As columnist Maureen Dowd wrote, Quote, for, cry for crying out loud, as one guy I know put it, I've tracked down women across the country with a lot, information, lot less information than that. Although Philip Zelikow, the 9-11 Commission staff director, was quoted as having said, the Hamburg cell is very important to the investigation of the September 11th attacks, and intelligence on Mr. Al-Shehi is an issue that's obviously of importance to us, and we're investigating it, on February 24, 2004, when asked, whether American intelligence officials gave sufficient attention to the information about Mr. Al-Shehi, Mr. Zelikow continued to say, we haven't reached any conclusions. Five months later, when the Commission released its final report, no further conclusion or explanation for the CIA's failure to follow the German lead was noted. Why did the Commission ignore this important piece of information and the CIA's failure to act on it? Five, watchlisting issues, a story of surveillance. 
An area that was addressed more thoroughly in the 9-11 Commission's final report was the matter of Pentagon Flight 77 hijackers Khalid Amador and Nawaf Al-Hazmi. However, because much of the information on these two important characters in fa is found in the minute text of the Commission's report footnotes, learning the details requires a magnifying glass. The Commission failed to explain how and why the CIA dropped the ball with information it acquired about the January 2000 terrorist summit in Malaysia. It has been reported that the 9-11 attacks and the USS coal bombings were planned at this meeting. In attendance were key coal bomber Khalad bin Atash and two of the would-be 9-11 hijackers, Khalid Almadar and Nawaf Al-Hazmi. Although the CIA identified the men as suspected extremists via their participation in the meeting with the identified coal bombing suspect, the CIA inexplicably failed to request that the two men be placed on the government's watch list until late August 2001. By that time, both Almadar and Al-Hazmi were already in the United States. And even though the men were living in San Diego listed by their correct names in the local phone book and their landlord was an FBI informant, the Bureau stated that it did not learn of their whereabouts until after 9-11. From the footnotes of the 9-11 Commission report, we learn that the CIA intentionally kept the FBI out of the loop with regard to these two hijackers who were living in this country. Had someone in the CIA made the decision to not inform the FBI about the, these two 9-11 hijackers? And if so, why did the 9-11 Commission bury it in a footnote and not address why such action was taken? The purposeful withholding of vital information by one intelligence agency from another intelligence agency is a type of failure that cannot be corrected or masked through simple reorganizational reforms of the intelligence community. Even a plain reading of the footnote detailing the CIA's dubious behavior raises serious questions that beg to be answered. In July 2005, in response to the 9-11 public discourse hearing on intelligence agencies, we wrote a press release that included the following information with regard to Chapter 6, quote, for, called From Threat to Threat. Footnote number 44. Footnote number 44 details an instance where a CIA desk officer intentionally withheld vital information from the FBI about two of the 9-11 hijackers who were inside the United States. This footnote further states that the CIA desk officer covered up the decision to withhold said vital information from the FBI. Finally, footnote number 44 states that the CIA desk officer could not recall who told her to carry out such acts. While several notable instances of this sort of intentional withholding of vital information from and among intelligence agencies are found throughout the 9-11 Commission's final report, we called special attention to four additional examples in our press release. We did so with the hope that the 9-11 Commissioners would now explain why the truth has not been revealed to the American public about one of our intelligence agencies' ongoing surveillance of the 9-11 hijackers while they were living inside the United States in the 18 months leading up to the 9-11 attacks. The leads to Almodar and Al-Hazmi in San Diego were key, but perhaps even more relevant was the earlier, earlier gleaned information about Marwan al-Shehi, because that information would have immediately unearthed the existence of the Hamburg cell, the epicenter from which the 9-11 plot was prepared. According to testimony given in Germany after the 9-11 attacks, al-Shehi was one of only four members of the Hamburg cell who knew about the 9-11 attacks beforehand. Marwan al-Shehi and Mohammed Atta traveled to Af Afghanistan in 2000 to train at an al-Qaeda ca training camp with several other September 11th plotters. And after returning to Germany, al-Shehi made an ominous reference regarding the World Trade Center to a Hamburg librarian saying, there will be thousands of dead. You will all think of me, German authorities said. Soon afterward, Atta, al-Shehi, and another plotter, Zia Jara, began emailing several dozen American flight schools from Germany to inquire about enrollment. They arrived in the United States late, later in 2000 to begin flight training. In its final report, the Commission continues to perpetuate the myth that the CIA's failure to communicate with the FBI was some sort of institutional failure and thus readily, readily, readily fixable by intelligence community reforms. That notion is extremely harmful to our nation. Why didn't the Commission address the intentional lack of communication between the CIA and the FBI? 
6, Planes as Missiles, the Story of the PDB. In spite of many explicit warnings, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice claimed that the administration was never warned of an attack before 9-11. Warned of an attack before 9 11 she went on national TV and stated, I don't think anybody could have predicted that they would try to use an airplane as a missile, a hijacked airplane as a missile. <clears throat> However, as previously recounted, there were many warnings that terrorists might use planes as missiles. How could the National Security Advisor to the President of the United States not have been aware of this possibility? Further, why, if this was indeed a breakdown of communication within the executive branch of our government, wasn't that addressed by the Commission? If the vital flow of information from the agencies to the National Security Advisor was somehow hampered, wouldn't we need to understand how and why this was in order to make sure that the proper channels of information to and from the executive branch were operational in the future? While Condoleezza Rice seems to have failed in her capacity as National Security Advisor to inform President Bush of such warnings, there were many others within the President's cadre of advisors who also could have apprised him of the same information. Yet on 5-1702, President Bush also seemed to have no idea about the threat, saying, had I known that the enemy was going to use airplanes to kill on that fateful morning, I would have done everything in my power to protect the American people. And to our further dismay, when Condoleezza Rice testified before the Commission in April of 2004, we learned that on August 6, 2001, the President had been briefed by the CIA about just such a possibility. Although Ms. Rice argued during her testimony that the Presidential Daily Brief of August 6, 2001 was historical in nature and didn't warn of a domestic threat, the title of the PDB was Bin Laden Determined to Strike in the United States. The title alone reveals that the document did indeed refer to a domestic threat and was, in fact, not a historical recap. At one point, to clarify and dispel the purely historical argument, I color-coded the PDB so that everyone could see exactly what parts of the PDB said that the threat was both domestic and current. I have done the same for this hearing. The orange is the domestic threat, and where it's yellow, highlighted in yellow, it's in the present tense, it's, it's current on both pages. <clears throat> An example of the current and domestic threat in the text of the August 6, 2001 PDB was the statement, nevertheless, FBI information since that time indicates patterns of suspicious activity in this country consistent with preparation for hijackings or other types of attacks, including recent surveillance of federal buildings in New York. Why did the 9-11 Commission fail to call Ms. Rice to account for her deliberately misleading public statements? Why wouldn't the Commission address the discrepancies between the sworn testimony and uncovered facts? Not holding witnesses accountable to the, for the veracity of their sworn testimony undermines the process. Seven. Patterns of Hijacking, the story of 52 warnings. We also hope that the 9-11 Commission would explain the patterns of hijacking language found in the PDB. Where did this information come from? Perhaps it originated with the FAA. The explanation was not found in the final report released on July 22, 2004. But months later, when the second monograph was finally made public that the Commission had produced, we learned that there had been actually 52 warnings issued by the FAA during the six months preceding 9-11. So when on September 11, 2001, Ari Fleischer, the White House Press Secretary, said there were no warnings, what could he have possibly meant? And what exactly did our government do with the 52 warnings it received during the summer of 2001? If nothing was done with regard to said warnings, why was that? And whose job was it to make sure that appropriate defensive action was taken? At the very least, directives could have been issued to airport screeners to be on the lookout for certain types of suspicious behaviors. On February 11, 2005, in response to the Commission's release of its FAA monograph, we sent out another press release. We stated, notably missing from this monograph is any information pertaining to NORAD's failure to scramble jets in a timely manner, which leads us to wonder what else is being withheld from the public. 
We went on to state, of the 105 warnings issued, 52 warnings regarding al-Qaeda were given to the FAA by, intelligence community, by the intelligence community in a six-month period from April 2001 to September 2001. According to the 9-11 Commission's final report, there were eight information circulars put out by the FAA between July 2nd and September 10th, 2001. Five of these information circulars targeted overseas threats, while the remaining three targeted domestic threats. And finally, we stated, the 52 threats regarding al-Qaeda were not received by the FAA in a vacuum. From March 2001 to September 2001, according to the Joint Inquiry of Congress, our intelligence community received at least 41 specific threats of a possible domestic attack by al-Qaeda. Additionally, the FAA was also made aware of the August 15, 2001 arrest of Zacharias Moussaoui. And finally, the FAA attended a high-level meeting on July 5, 2001, where the domestic threat posed by al-Qaeda was discussed by all relevant intelligence agencies. The FAA monograph reveals that in the spring of 2001, the FAA had already determined that if the intent of the hijacker is not to exchange hostages for prisoners, but to commit suicide in its spectacular explosion, a domestic hijacking would probably be, be preferable. It would seem that during the summer of 2001, there were indeed enough warnings and concern that all agencies should have been put on alert. Action should have and could have been taken. Nevertheless, the 9-11 commissioners never once reflected upon whose job it was to coordinate all those pieces of evidence. They also left unaddressed the fact that with all this information floating throughout the agencies in the summer of 2001, why didn't our National Security Council convene to discuss the very pertinent, very relevant issue of terrorism until September 4th, 2001, a mere seven days before 9-11. Eight, accountability, the story of the lack thereof. To date, no one has ever been held accountable for 9-11. Government officials who failed in their jobs were promoted and given medals. Terrorists have yet to be indicted or successfully prosecuted. Even the so-called masterminds, Ramzi bin al-Sheib and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, have yet to be prosecuted, and Osama bin Laden is still on the loose, evading capture. <clears throat> when we learned that German prosecutor Dr. Krauss was scheduled to testify before the 9-11 Commission in June of 2004, I wrote the following email and sent it off to the commissioners. I am especially interested in learning what the German prosecutor, Dr. Krauss, thought about the U.S. government not turning over people, such as Ramzi bin al-Sheib, or transcripts of his interrogation, who was reportedly in, the US in U.S. custody at a secure location. This lack of cooperation by the U.S. government made it impossible for the German courts to successfully prosecu prosecute Mr. Mazzuti, who was put on trial in Germany for crimes related to 9-11. Dr. Krauss never did testify before the Commission. Our questions for him regarding the lack of cooperation between the U.S. government and the German government, which led to the release of suspected terrorist Mazzuti Amatasadek, also remain unanswered. The Commission's report <clears throat> only tells us that Mazzuti Amatasadek witnessed the execution of Mohammed Atta's will. If these two men were truly involved in the 9-11 plot, why didn't the U.S. government turn over all of the evidence in their possession in order to convict these two men? Why would our government refuse to cooperate with the German government in order to help incarcerate such known terrorists? Why did the 9-11 Commission report fail to address this in a substantive manner? And more pointedly, how will we ever win the war on terror without prosecuting and holding terrorists accountable? Nine. Air Defense, the story of NORAD's belated response. In other defense capacities on the morning of 9-11, the Commission's report discusses the actions of the FAA, NORAD, and NEEDS. In particular, I make reference to footnote number 116, page 458, which says that on 9-11, NORAD was scheduled co to conduct a military exercise, Vigilant Guardian, which postulated a bomber attack from the former Soviet Union. We investigated whether military preparations for the large-scale exercise compromised the military's response to the real-world terrorist attack on 9-11. Accordingly, the newly sworn-in Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Eberhardt, said that it took the military about 30 seconds to make the adjustment to the real-world real world situation. But the following words, which show there was confusion, have troubled me since my research began. Needs. 
This comes from the Commission report and from the day of 9-11 transcripts. Needs. Is this real world or exercise? FAA. No, this is not an exercise, not a test. On page 20, we note more confusion. Needs did not know where to send the alert fighter aircraft, and the officer directing the fighters pressed for more information. Quote, I don't know where I'm scrambling these guys to. I need a direction, a destination. Close quote. And on page 26, <clears throat> NORAD heard nothing about the search for American 77. Instead, the Needs Air Defender Defenders heard renewed reports about a plane that no longer existed, American 11. At 9.21, Needs received a report from the FAA. FAA, Military Boston Center. I just had a report that American 11 is still in the air and on its way towards, heading toward Washington. Needs, okay, American 11 is still in the air? FAA, yes, Needs, on its way toward Washington? FAA, that was another, it was evidently another aircraft that hit the tower. That's the latest report we have, Needs, okay. FAA, I'm going to try to confirm an ID for you, but I would assume he's somewhere over uh, New Jersey or somewhere further south. Needs, okay, so American 11 isn't the hijack at all then? FAA, no, he's a hijack. Needs, he, American 11 is a hijack? FAA, yes. Needs, and he's heading into Washington? FAA, yes, this could be a third aircraft. The mention of a third aircraft was not a reference to American 77. As the commission report says, there was confusion at, the mo at that moment in the FAA. And General Eberhardt's claim that the military exercises somehow made the military better prepared on 9-11 does not ring true. Instead, it appears that the concurrent military exercises completely confused everyone. Flight 11 was the flight that hit the first building at the World Trade Center in New York City. Thus far, we are still waiting for the monograph on the failures of NORAD that the Commission said it would produce. 10. Toothless investigation, the story of subpoena power not used. While the Department of Defense and others were threatened with subpoenas for not being forthcoming with information requested, we were of the mindset that all known evidence pertaining to September 11th should have been subpoenaed by the Commission from the outset with no exceptions. No stone, which, by the way, was also the mandate of the 9-11 Commission. No stone should have remained unturned, and yet this was not the case. For example, with regard to videos that recorded the Pentagon crash, we knew of at least three versions of videos that showed the crash of Flight, 90, of Flight 77, yet only one version ever made its way into the public domain. That version had the date stamp of 9-12 instead of 9-11-01. The time stamps repeated on two of the five frames while the other frames, with other times on the frames were missing. We had made, read in National Geographic about the second video that was recorded by cameras located at the Sheraton Hotel overlooking the Pentagon. We also read about the third video recording that showed the crash from the nearby Nexcom gas station security camera. We asked the Commission, specifically Team 8, to subpoena for these videos, and just before the Commission released its final report, we met with some of them. They told us that they had not subpoenaed for this evidence, but had instead issued document requests, which were never answered. This seeming lack of persistence on the part of the Commission to collect all known evidence is worrisome. Again, if in fact they were unwilling to go after easily attainable evidence, what other critical and more difficult pieces of the story were they missing? How was one to feel comfortable with their investigation knowing that they were not aggressively pursuing the most tangible of evidence or information? Also missing from the Commission's definitive report is testimony from national security whistleblowers who had tried to testify before the Commission but were either asked were either not asked to testify or their testimony was only barely acknowledged or worse yet, completely omitted from the record. This list includes Robert Wright, FBI agent, whom the FBI refused to allow to testify and the Commission did not subpoena him. John M. Cole, FBI counterintelligence who had pertinent information with regard to Pakistan, Afghanistan and the 9-11 attacks. He notified the 9-11 Commission during its tenure but never received a response back from them. Colleen Rowley, FBI Division Counsel. The FBI Commission did not interview her and chose instead to rely on tran transcripts from the Joint Senate House Intelligence Inquiry. Mike German, FBI Counterintelligence. In, FB in, in February 2004, his name and contact information were provided to the Commission as a key witness, 
but they never called him to testify. Mark Burton, senior analyst at NSA, he provided dozens of pages of information and testimony to the 9-11 Commission, but was ignored and was never invited to testify. Beru Sashar, language specialist at the FBI, he was refused twice by the Commission to testify, but finally did testify. However, his testimony was omitted from the final report. This list is in no way complete. Rather, it is just a small sample of legitimate witnesses or corroborators of valuable 9-11 related information to provide that they tried to provide to the Commission, but they were instead turned away. Knowing full well that the best source of how an agency really works would entail talking to the people who actually work there, why is it that the Commission refused these key witnesses an opportunity to tell what they knew? How could the Commission be trusted to make the right decisions without obtaining all pertinent information? Worse yet, what happens when the Commission actively and knowingly ignores that information? One whistleblower that we made sure the Commission met with was FBI translator Sibel Edmonds. It was only when we walked her into the Commission's offices that they agreed to hear what she had to say. Sibel is here. Once the report was released, Sibel read it with great hope. Disappointed in the Commission's failure to address her very real concerns, she wrote in an open letter, quote, unfortunately, I find your report seriously flawed in its failure to address serious intelligence issues that I am aware of, which have been confirmed, and which, as a witness to the Commission, I have made you aware of. Thus, I must assume that other serious issues that I am not aware of were in the same manner omitted from your report. These omissions cast doubt on the validity of your report and therefore on its conclusions and recommendations. Close quote. A thorough and definitive investigation by the Commission would have addressed all of her concerns and spoken to all of the whistleblowers. It would have subpoenaed for the information it required and examined the plethora of information that, that other citizens and groups responsibly provided. And finally, without compromising our national security, it would have reported all of its findings with its redactions blacked out and submitted to the American people. In essence, the Commission could have produced a final product where the resulting conclusions and recommendations could be trusted. Instead, at the end of the day, what we got were some statements that truly insulted the intelligence of the American people, violated our loved ones' memories, and might end up hurting us one day soon. One such statement was that 9-11 that was a failure of imagination. A failure of whose imagination? What exactly does that mean? When you have a CIA director with his hair on fire, a system blinking red, 52 FAA warnings, an August 6, 2001 PDB entitled Bin Laden Determined to Strike in the United States, leads on several 9-11 hijackers, including al-Hazmi, al-Madar, and Marwan al-Shehi, warnings from many foreign governments, a Phoenix memo warning of Islamic extremists taking flying lessons, the arrest of would-be terrorist Zacharias Musawi, facts imparted to one agent, Agent Frasca at the RFU of the FBI. 9-11 was truly a failure, all right, but I would certainly not call it a, a failure of imagination. Once again, these warnings and threats were not received in a vacuum, nor were they so common an occurrence that they should have been ignored in the wholesale and brazen manner in which they were. To me, it seems rather clear that there were enough warnings making their way to the appropriate people that meant that the proverbial dots should have and could have all been connected. And thus, in light of all the incoming information in 2001, exactly whose failure was it to understand that our new enemy was terrorism, and exactly who failed us by not having the agencies do anything in a defensive posture to, pr to protect Americans from just this possibility? Another outrageous statement made at the time of the release of the 9-11 final report that got a fair amount of media coverage was the one, everyone's to blame, therefore no one's to blame. The problem with that assumption is that it creates a no-fault government. And a no-fault government does nothing to ensure that things will be different or better in the future. When you hold people accountable, it serves as a deterrent for those that would repeat that same behavior in the future. For the record, I would like to see that assumption restated to read, everyone's to blame, therefore everyone's to blame. In fact, the fact that there has been no accountability for the failures that led to the deaths of almost 3,000 people is truly unconscionable and irresponsible on the part of all of our nation's leaders. So what do we do now? The tools of democracy available to the citizens of America to address these issues are incredibly limited. 
We asked for an independent commission to investigate 9-11 because that was the only tool that we, as American citizens, had access to and hope that our leaders, the members of Congress, and the American public would ensure its validity and that its ensuing recommendations would make us all safer, all as safe as we could reasonably expect to be in the event of another attack. We spent 14 months collecting information and lobbying for the creation of the commission and another 20 plus months monitoring the commission's work, forwarding any and all research, making sure to send along our questions for the witnesses who were questioned, attending the hearings, making phone calls and lobbying for the extensions of time and money, sending thousands of emails, all in the hope that in the end, Americans could feel confident that we had indeed the definitive story of 9-11. Sadly, as Americans, we have all been let down. On the morning of 9-11, I lost my husband and best friend of almost 16 years. My two children, Matt and Sarah, lost their beloved father on that terrible day. And from, and from that horrible day of September 11, 2000 forward, it has been made clear that in not allowing for truth and justice to prevail, America may have forever lost her way. For those who might question the reasoning and importance for reexamining the Commission's report, the events that led up to and the day of September 11th, one only has to recall the enormous ramifications that the attacks of September 11th have had on our country. Our leaders have, almost overnight, reformed government agencies and instituted innumerable law laws in the interest of national security and are, and are living in a post-9-11 era. Some, like the controversial Patriot Act, were forced through Congress without the benefit of congressional debate to determine its necessity and effectively find the proper balance between national security and our civil liberties. More lethally, our foreign policy has shifted to one of preemption and thus we are at war in both Afghanistan and Iraq, where so many of our good men and women serving in the armed forces have lost their lives or have come home forever maimed. It is important to look back because in order for our leaders to make wise decisions about the changes we are instituting, we must understand what it was exactly that went wrong, that allowed our nation to become so vulnerable to terrorism, and we should not and we should not feel it improper to re-examine the investigations and decisions already made, especially in light of the fact that right after the 9-11 attacks, our leaders went full speed ahead with so many changes, most without the benefit of much of the information that has only recently been made available. Again, with lives on both sides of the equation, we cannot afford to be wrong or caught off guard either over there or here at home like we were on the morning of 9-11. Thus, only an honest reevaluation of how the 9-11 attacks could have happened will allow us to reverse the adverse consequences of overreaching laws and the existing loopholes in our security systems in order to allow us to be safer in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie, for that very compelling and uh, well-researched testimony and for reminding us of why we are all here, outlining those very important yet unanswered questions. Um, Laurie, do you have a copy of your document, your well-researched document for Congresswoman McKinney's staff? Okay. Okay. We'd like to have that.